Our next speaker is Josh Clevenger, and the title of his presentation is Fast, Accurate, Low Coverage Sequencing for Genome-Wide Genotyping Large Populations uh, for Genetic Improvement. Um, so hopefully Josh has an opportunity to share his screen and get started. Perfect. Thank you, Josh. Yeah, thanks, Jeff. Uh, that is a crappy title after I heard you read it. That was that was a bad job by me. Anyway, uh, uh, <laughs> I haven't real I didn't I didn't realize uh, how much I missed being at APRIS until I didn't get to go for two years. And I, I, I miss being there and hanging out with all of you. So hopefully next year we'll get to do that again. But it's but it's fun to to present to you all. I've been presenting to a lot of people that don't know much about peanuts. So it's a it's a it's it's great to be back uh, with, with you all and presenting. And I'm really excited about what we're going to be talking about today. So I want to go back in time a little bit, um, actually, to my very first presentation at my very first APRIS in um, San Antonio in 2014. And there's an interesting story along with that. I actually, um, there was a mishap. And instead of putting me in the graduate student competition, they had placed me in a, in a breakout session. And that was wrong because I was a first year PhD student. And um, but there were some people that were interested in what I was going to be presenting. It was part of the genome project and they had planned, you know, to, to see me at that time. And so they had me present twice. So I presented the graduate competition and then in this general session. And my first ever uh, presentation for APRIS, I won the Bailey Award, uh, and this was what it was about. And so uh, I think that's probably the only time that has happened. Hopefully, I know Craig won it twice, but my very first APRIS, I won the Bailey Award. I'm pretty proud of that. But um, so this was about uh, identifying SNPs from sequence data, and this is old news now, but I, but I, uh, I wanted to talk about it. So so what are the issues? So the issues were, you know, is the is the short read mapping to the genome in the right place? So at that time, we were working with the first iteration of the diploid genomes that had just sort of come uh, put together um, at that time. Is the is the right base call in the Illumina read? So you might think, you know, you trim the ends of Illumina reads and you're like, oh, this is good. But actually, there's a lot of sort of uh, uh, low quality bases within those reads as well. Um, and that can cause problems. And as well as sort of what we deal with in peanut with the with the two genomes that are very uh, similar and then also gene families and repetitive sequence. So this idea of prologous mapping from gene families and genome duplication that, that causes problems. So those are our issues and those are the issues we are having. So we developed SWEEP and this was a figure from, from the SWEEP sort of uh, paper uh, that came about after that um, where we simulated SNPs and we said, if we just use the same methods that everybody else is using in humans and other crops, um, what sort of recovery of true SNPs do we get? It's very low and this is, this is completely unbiased. Um, and when we use sweep, we, we did much better. In fact, with high enough coverage, we got close to 100%. So that was sort of the first um, pipeline that we developed to, to help alleviate this problem about seven years ago now, Peggy and I. Um, and uh, we used an anchor. So I put that in, a, in parentheses there or, or quotation marks. We use an anchor to separate the subgenome haplotypes. So this is sort of representation of what that looks like when you have sort of um, a and B genome copies, reads from them, pile up in the same place, you can, you can use computationally see, oh, this is one haplotype from this subgenome, this is the other. And then with, with that, you can look between genotypes and decide, oh, okay, this is a real SNP. So that's how we did it. Um, and um, there were huge outcomes from that. I mean, uh, it was just it was like a, a, a big out, uh, this is a big effort that a lot of people contributed to. I mean, all the all the genome project stuff was coming out. So there's all these resources and and uh, uh, some lines had been resequenced, which was like new at that time, which sounds crazy now, um, about 20 lines. And we had the diploid genomes and there were some groups that were talking about uh, identifying a SNP or developing a SNP array. And so this pipeline sort of came at the right time. We developed the SNP array and it, it just led to this sort of explosion of, of work that was able to be done because we had we had this new sort of easy, cheapish uh, way to genotype large populations. So these are some of my favorites. Um, uh, Paul and uh, uh, Stephen Ethy's paper on uh, the characterization of the core collection is incredible paper that's going to be useful for for decades for a lot of students and researchers and 
um, all the all the really delicate and beautiful work that Soraya and David did looking at the segmental allo polyploidy. Um, they were doing that with with the array stuff. Um, and then the, the sweep pipeline itself allowed us to do some QTL seq that we couldn't do before and some uh, using sequencing to uh, 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 for uh, real populations. Um, so there's a lot of things that were able to be done. Um, but at the same time, it still wasn't that good. Um, it was, quite frankly, not very good at all, in my opinion. Um, the way that we filtered was very biased. You had to have this anchor base there. You had to have a region where the A and the B regions piled together, which is like essentially you're you're filtering against single copy regions, which is really weird and and not something that we want to do. There was this odd residual positional ambiguity, which which um, was because of the way we were identifying the SNPs. Um, we really needed high read depth, which meant that it was still pretty expensive. Like we couldn't use this on a breeding scale, which, which is always what our goal is. And we couldn't filter de novo in bulk sequence. So we couldn't like take a QTLC experiment, just the bulk sequence and, and uh, analyze it straight from the bulk. So something better had to be done. Um, and so when we think about QTL sequencing, this is sort of the flagship paper where they first started um, uh, using whole genome sequence to, to do the bulk segregate analysis. And it's really just, you have a trait of interest and you're looking at the extremes of the distribution and you say, um, I'm gonna sequence individuals on this extreme and on the opposite extreme. And you uh, look at the allele frequency in those bulks um, between the samples. And your hypothesis is if there's genetic control of this trait, these bulks, the allele frequency will segregate at the genomic locations that is controlling uh, uh, that trait. So you get a peak. So that's the idea. It doesn't ever look like that, of course, in real life. Um, so this is what it looks like in peanut using the standard approach. And this is like the up, the most up-to-date sort of, this is what the, the good labs, the good informatics people do, right? So they align to the reference genome. They're going to filter for unique mapping for the highest quality. These are things that you use within the sort of uh, aligner that you're using. There's a minimum depth, you know, to make sure that you have, you know, it's not sequence error. There's a maximum depth to try and get rid of repetitive regions. And then you sort of filter for a minor allele frequency. So, the, you know, they use like less than 0.3 and that gets rid of base errors that aren't really in your population. So this is what it looks like in peanut. Yeah, we can see that there are um, potential QTLs there probably, but this is this is really not useful because we can't really uh, discern the genetic architecture. Um, we just would be like blindly picking SNPs in there to, to develop markers for. We can't really pinpoint genes. This is kind of a waste of time in a lot of ways. Um, so we use SWEET. Uh, early on, and we said, okay, why don't we sequence the parents of high coverage, look for parental SNPs that are high quality, and then use those in the bulk sequence analysis, of course, filter for depth, and we did that, um, and uh, by the way, this, what I'm showing is, there's QTLs from a project uh, with Graham Wright, led by Graham Wright, where we, we helped him sort of identify two really strong QTLs for blanching percentage, um, uh, it's is really nice work uh, to, uh, uh, with Graham. Um, and so, yeah, this is better. I mean, there's less noise. It's still not that good. We still like don't have a lot of uh, resolution. And so it's not overall as useful as we would like. Um, and so um, this is really about what I did on my pandemic vacation. So uh, Waleed Karani, who led all of the development of this, and I sort of, we sort of um, had ideas back and forth, you know, how can we do this better? And that, that was our, that was our goal. And we, we essentially, this is the last time I'm going to present about this ever in my career, because we did it. It's over. This is the best that can be done. And so exciting because the future now holds a lot of possibilities that I'm going to go over in a little bit, hopefully. Um, and we call it Khufu because well, it's great naming things and peaks in QTLC kind of look like a pyramid. Um, so that's that's what it's called. And so this is this is the same data set with Kufu. You can see um, this is completely analyzed de novo in the bulks, no parental sequence at all. Um, you can see this, uh, the bottom peak, it's beautiful. There's hardly any noise within that peak. It's all signal, which is what we expect based on our genetics classes. Uh, but if we if we sort of show a graph of that, the distribution of the delta sniff values under that peak. With our standard approach I showed before, there's a ton around zero and below 0.2, which is all noise. 
Um, and in Khufu, it's mostly Signal. So this is um, when when Waleed first sent me the first sort of output of what we were doing, I was just like, it was like one of the best days of my life. I was like, this is amazing. And so um, you might say to yourself, oh, well, you, is this just sort of like, you know, uh, driven by unique mapping and mapping quality? No, because here is the Khufu output when we don't uh, use unique mapping and we don't use mapping quality. Um, and this is just sort of our approach, our internal approach uh, to filtering in, uh, in complex genomes. And it's still basically the same. So um, it's really a, a, a uh, the, the whole is greater than the sum of its parts. We have we have individual sort of uh, layers of this that, that that get this done, and it's it's really nice. Um, so the other part is we've done a lot of development with uh, with indels. So here is a sort of uh, QTL seq experiment that uh, Reagan Wiggins it was Reagan Holton was a part of her uh, master's project. Um, the top is only SNPs, and you can see that peak there, um, and the bottom is only indels. So we also Profile indels, we it, and we can validate it by by looking at it between the difference between the SNPs and the indels. So that's just profiling indels. It looks almost exactly the same. And here's a really interesting indel that we that's in the peak that we are following up on with with Peggy. Um, and it's a it's a basically a, a deletion that that knocks out a gene. Um, so this is really it's really interesting. It gives it gives the analysis a whole nother layer to be able to look at these large and small SVs along with the SNPs. So um, we have a we have a fee for service, uh, I guess you could call it product, but it's really, in my view, it's a you know it's a it's a platform of whole genome genotyping non model species and complex polyploid genomes. Uh, this is like facilitates very easy collaboration because it's sort of like a you know this is what we need invoices we do everything for you we we get we get uh, dna and we sequence and analyze it in this complete package um and uh you know this was this was developed for peanut and so you know it's uh I'm, I'm we're already working with a lot of groups right now um, um carolina mentioned it and um uh we we think this next year or two we're gonna peanut is gonna be have something that that you all can use um, and and deliver on your on your genetics projects that a lot of other crops and communities don't really have something as good uh, have access to. So the, so I think this is going to be really cool for for people to see like uh, peanut uh, running rushing ahead. So we're really excited about that. Um, and I probably don't have a, a, a limited time, but one of the my the most exciting outcomes of this is is this sort of low pass genotyping, which is what this whole presentation is about. And so we went back at Baoju's S population. It was sequenced as a part of the genome project. It was sequenced the whole genome sequencing, 5X coverage. This was in 2012. So the, actually the, the data quality is quite poor, um, but um, initially it was analyzed with Garav and, and Baoju and I, and I helped them do this. We used sweep, we, we, we mapped uh, 11,000 SNPs with the full coverage of all the lines. And if you were to, sequence a real population at 5x coverage is actually like still like pretty expensive to do that um and so yeah it was good and we mapped the resistance and everything was was kumbaya and great um so i had what what we did was we looked at the same sequence basically down sampled it way down to half x coverage per line um used our sort of khufu platform we could call almost ninety thousand snips with less than 25% missing data. Um, and we analyze those SNPs based on the full coverage um, and some array data. And we have greater than 99% accuracy. Um, and there's the sort of a physical map of the population. That's chromosome one. You can see like very little noise in there. So this is like straight off of the pipeline. It's incredible when I first saw this. Um, and then the best part is, and this is the end, the best part is, is um, now in populations, if you sequence the whole population and we do this very cheaply, it's almost about the price of the array, a little cheap, cheaper in some situations. Um, you can bulk your populations on any of the traits that you have. So if you've measured like seven or eight or nine or 10 traits, you can do QTL, QTL seq over and over and over and over and over again. Um, and this is just an example of TSWV from uh, NC94022, which Albert pointed out is the uh, incredible source of resistance. There is the uh, gene right in there that was fine mapped with, with Baoju's work and we, we find it this way as well. Um, and so I, 
I have a lot of plans for doing this in all of my work. And I'm really excited about the power and the that we now have because we're not sequencing bulks where we don't know the individual genotypes. Now we know the individual genotypes. We do the bulk sequencing, we identify the regions, and then we really have high resolution of what's in there. So it's really exciting, highly accurate, very low coverage, makes it very cheap. It makes it the, in a breeding context, very affordable for your populations, flexible to population structure. I've worked all sorts of you know, Graham's work was like, uh, he just gave me breeding lines, right? It wasn't like biparental or anything. Um, completely eliminates astrotainment bias, which is a huge problem um, and uh, really provides uh, a lot of power for genotyping and trait mapping de novo. Um, and so, yeah, so so starting in January, we're, we're, we have a new greenhouse. This is our groundbreaking from last week. I thought this was this was cool to show this. Uh, we had our ceremony and those those are the five faculty here at Hudson Alpha that work on plants. So we're really excited about the new era and, uh, you know, uh, really excited about a place like Hudson Alpha focusing on peanuts and continuing to uh, to to do fun work. So that's all.